It did. But we've got another guest in studio, another fantastic guest. And uh, this is now our last interview for the year. So it's, no. a, it's, a, so it's a special guest as well. Luby, uh, do some introducing because we, we know these kind of individuals are too humble and they're, they're just going to gloss this, over stuff. Listen to this, future CEOs, listen to this. Dean, strategist, educator, education designer, entrepreneur, international business executive, academic and consultant, and, 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 Dean John Foster Pedley. Welcome to Future CEOs. How do you feel about sure. that intro? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder who you're talking about. For a <laughs> Welcome to the show, truly. Thanks. Did I say enough? Did I say too little? How would you describe yourself? I'm passionate about, about learning. I mean, I'm a late dad, you know, so I've got a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old kid. Kira Marie and Nomakwezi uh, and Ayanda is, is my boy. And I'm absolutely fascinated by what world are we going to create for them? And to me, I'm fortunate to be an educationalist. So what drives me is how do we create a world for your kids, my kids? Have you got kids? Not yet. You're far too young. I'm, let's not go there. <laughs> I've been exposed. I can tell. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I'm listening. I'm listening. You've yeah. got me. You've got me. I'm and so how do we make a world for them that's going to be, you know, that all our kids can, can, can live well and with a quality of life? It's not all about acquisition and buying new things. And, but how are we going to have a life that's fulfilling and fun and light at the same time? So not like a heavy vibe there, you know, but a life that, you know, you think it's cool, you know. No, I, I'm surprised to I'm hear there. I'm so there, yeah. a dean of a business school, so Henley Business School in mm. this case, saying yeah. that kind of thing. Because uh, really, uh, I think that kind of environment, there's a lot of competition. It is, uh, let's call it hot and heavy. Uh, how are you bringing balance to yourself if you're in that kind of environment, but you have this kind of outlook? Mm. Well, it's very interesting. I think business schools, we're part of a very big international business school, and we're supposed to be one of the top 1% in the world oldest one in Europe. Nice. But you think about it, you know, that's my only plug, okay? <laughs> Henley. Okay. Can I get away with that? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> but if you think about it, when you think business school, you think these sort of Grecian columns and the, the whole building, the edifice of Harvard. And mm. It's so serious. And I can't, you know, I'm a It stru- sounds so nice to yeah. some people. Yeah, and it is good, you know, this elite thing. Mm. But really, when you think about the world we live in, I mean, most of the stuff we do is, is via business or, or organization. It's via interaction. And we're sitting in a studio as a business, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we live our lives in that environment. So why have we got to, why have we got to pretend to be something we're not? And mm. if you're going to be creative, you can't button yourself up and say, I'm going to be very straight now, and that, but now I've got to put on my creative hat. Mm. So if business schools are doing a good job, it's not for the elite. It's for everybody. If they've if they got stuff that's going to help people make run better businesses, use money better, create value for people, create a society you want to live in, then that's got to be for everyone, not just some narrow elite. Mm. So how can a business school create something that's going to help people do their businesses or to provide value for other people in society. We say we build a people that build the businesses that build Africa. And that's the business school's mission. And you don't try and say, I'm going to build an MBA degree for a narrow, narrow elite mm-hmm. person who's going to sit in a corner office and tell everyone how smart he is. He's going to say, out of my way, I'm a strategist mm-hmm. with the D, strategist, it's not strategy. <laughs> you, know. you know what I mean? So it's, you, you've got to have this kind of, thing going where you're doing something that's got a value to it. Education matters. Yeah. So we better do good education. We better take it seriously. But education's also got to be motivational and inspiring and challenging and irritating as well as just cool and smooth, you know. I would be fascinated. What a great dean. Yeah, exactly. What a great dean. I was just thinking, uh, um, we must chat to some of, uh, some of the people in the team here uh, just, to, just to test. What a cool how dean. How cool. <laughs> I'm like, that's rad. Yeah, maybe does a little rad <laughs> sign. Uh, no, I'm just really embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> how long have you been uh, dean at Henley? Mm. I've been dean at Henley for six years. Before that, okay. I was 15 years at the University of Cape Town. I designed okay. and ran the executive MBA there. Okay. Spent some time in New Zealand running Innovation Center. And I've got a very long odd backstory which we may get to anyway no we, we must get uh, to mm-hmm. uh the backstory also includes on an airbus and a couple of other things yeah? what mm. is mb8 you're a founder of that that's i think that's cool. that's the coolest yeah why should why should why should business schools be about i mean just take mba marriage breakup academy 
Okay. Why, why should an I've MBA... I've never heard that before. Why should an <laughs> MBA... Why should it damage families? I mean, right. how responsibly are you as an educator if you right. create education things that are going to hurt kids mm. and, you know, and damage relationships? And you come in to show me a photograph of your family. Oh, yeah, there it is. Rip it up and throw it away and don't look at it for two years. What nonsense is that? Mm. What we're trying to do is create leaders in a society where people integrate their families. And, and if we're clever at education design, we should be able to create education that doesn't hurt families. So mm. family-friendly MBA is part of what we do. Love that. And with, Love that, that lies within this idea of MBA. And, and MBA is how do you turn the work of education and executives on program into something that's going to link to helping NGOs or small and medium enterprises and also ground people. Mm. And so they end up working with NGOs on action learning projects. We've worked with about 250 of those so far. And you'd think that gives value to the NGOs. It gives a lot more value to the people who are doing it. I've got this picture of James Mitchell, I think he is, mm -hmm. holding two. He's a, he's a Brit and he's holding two beautiful little African babies in his hand, you know. And, and you think, wow, that guy's come to help these African mm -hmm. babies and you know, all that stuff. They, the kids are smiling, you know, but the person who's smiling most is James. Mm -hmm. He's getting 110% more out of it than, than anyone else yeah, is. There. It transforms thing. him. Yeah. It grounds him. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, got me carried away there. <laughs> I lo and we do bursaries. We do lots of bursaries. Yeah. Well, what's so nice about the fact that you get carried away? That means mm. you really believe in what you're doing. We do. Yeah, I do. And that, that's significant. I, I do want us to go into your history, though. So, mm. how did you get to this point where you believe in what you do? How did you get to a point where you are saying the things that you you're saying, but then also doing them as well? So, let's go into your journey. Let's mm. let's look at that backstory that you've just said. We mm. we may or may not get into. Let's get into it. Tell us a little bit about your journey, who you are, um, and then I know we've got some really good questions lined up based on what you share. Well, I'm a sort of middle-class Brit, you know, who was born in a long time ago. Um, <laughs> not that long. Not and, that long. <clears throat> and so I, you know, private school, privileged education, military mm. family, but it was a very sort of ascetic family. There wasn't, we weren't politicized or business oriented. It was kind of like a, the, the, the warrior service type of family. My, okay. my father was a wartime fighter ace. And so I was brought up in that environment and then went to, got a scholarship to the RAF College Cranwell in the UK as a pilot with Royal Air Force. Um, that was interesting. And then they decided to take our, us career officers to go and study and, you know, get degrees. And mm. so in my ignorance and my father's, um, probably wasn't quite sure about it, he got, he got me to study sociology at the Polytechnic of Central London okay. in the late 60s, early 70s. Interesting time to be My, my hair, you could hardly see it. It was cut up to here. Everyone else's hair was down to their knees, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. shrouded in smoke of all kinds, you know, and it was really the Timothy Leary days and this free-thinking hippie vibe. Well, I, I think and of uh, Richard Branson doing his yeah. thing Correct. in the basement, uh, yeah, surrounded he, by you know, that kind of stuff. In fact, Richard Branson comes from just the village next door to where I live, and oh, it was about a year nice. or two older than me. And so we, we're very similar backgrounds, in, mm. except he's a lot richer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should have been born in that village. So then, what then happened, I met all these people. I met these South African emigres then, who were these kind of hippie types who were wandering around and exploring consciousness in the very alternative ways they chose to do in those yeah, days. I don't know yeah. how much I can talk about that. Well, well just yeah. don't admit to anything. Yeah, right. No, no. Nobody inhaled. <laughs> and, um, so, <clears throat> and so it was fascinating because it, we really started thinking about the counterculture and, and the challenge of the Vietnam War and everything. And, and I got really involved in that and brought my way out of the Air Force. And grew my own hair and, and became a sort of alternative hippie for two or three years. And I did mm. many jobs from jobbing gardeners to, to working in old people's homes to cleaning nuclear power stations oh, to wow. working on mushroom wow. farms. Loads and loads of jobs to really detox from my middle class upbringing, I suppose. Mm. And um, then joined the sort of Hindu ashram for a while in Europe for about four or five years meditating. Okay. Wow. My, that was my wow. sort of curious 20s. You yeah. know? And it was all part of this search for consciousness. And then I went back into flying, and I, and I got a job selling aircrafts and worked my way through as a flying instructor, and then got, a, got my commercial flying licenses. And then because I met all these South Africans, I really wanted to come to South Africa because it seemed like these were very interesting people, and mm. this was an amazing country. Well, it is. It is. Yeah, so it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. came to the right place. So I got a job flying, bush flying and instructing, and then eventually as an airline pilot in South Africa and an airline captain. And I did that at a fantastic time. And then I went back to England, and um, my mum was sick, so I thought I'd spend some time there, obviously, and got a job selling airliners in Africa and the Middle East for the biggest exporter in Britain called British Aerospace. Mm. 
And then I found out about an MBA. And my boss, who was, um, if you know French and Saunders, you know AbFab. Absolutely uh, fabulous. Absolutely yeah, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. You know Jennifer kind Saunders of. there. Like, yeah, she's she's a comedian there. Her dad was my boss. Okay. He used to tell me great and very amusing stories about all these incredibly introvert comedians who used to sit around his house, you know, twiddling their thumbs, not talking to anybody. The moment they got on stage, they just blossomed. Oh yeah. wow! In fact, Jennifer's flat once got um, a whole house was once uh, ransacked by robbers, and they, all the police came up. And they got up to her room, and all the place was a mess. And they said, like, oh, this place is worse. This is going to hit worse. This is the only room that hasn't been burgled. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they lived in oh, it. saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, oh, so I did the MBA, and then, then I started um, – and then, can I can yeah. I interrupt you? Why yeah. did you do an MBA? So we we did a we Very had a conversation. Question. I think you guys were there at Leader X uh, a little mm. while ago, and we did a conversation called "To MBA or Not to MBA," mm. and we deliberately chose not to have any head of mm. any business school there because mm. we wanted to get a bit of an alternative perspective mm. on it. So I'm just interested. Why did you do an MBA? Well, I'd um, I'd dropped out of my degree. Um, because I became all sort of alternative at that mm, time. Mm. It was in my 20s. So when I was young and foolish, I was young and foolish, as George Bush once memorably said. Yeah. Um, so I felt that I hadn't packaged my experience into sort of words that worked. And I didn't have the jargon. I was now working corporate life in British aerospace with all these kind of zooty people who knew what they were talking about yeah. and understood money. Yeah. And um, so I felt I needed a bit of that. And I also needed the validation. I'd, I'd done a lot of things. I needed the validation sort of that I could do these things and, and get my master's degree. Mm -hmm. And also it was something much, much deeper because the sort of underlying context, I suppose, with me is I've always been very, very curious. So, so the alternative years were very much about searching, not about hedonism. It's all about trying to find meaning and sense and mm -hmm. what's it all about and consciousness and trying to be aware. And so the MBA for me was a way of just spending a good year or two. And I was very fortunate. I got sponsored to an extremely good business school in Europe, which was challenging. And it mm. helped me frame my thinking. And it took me from one place totally to another. Mm. Um, and I got more and more curious about people, the mechanics of getting things done, about strategy in particular. How do we think strategically? Because... Mm. You know, we have problems in the world. We haven't got the thinking process to resolve, uh, resolve them. So how do we think better and differently and collectively so we can actually come up with solutions that our kids are going to live in a better world? And certainly we're not going to do it the old way we've done it. Sure. So it was all that sort of stuff that was driving me at the time. And, and also I loved teaching. So I, mm. I got a job straight after that. So it was just being in that environment that I found stretching on every level you can think about, personally, intellectually, dynamically with the other people. Um, making sense of big, big ideas mm. that were sure business, so they weren't pure philosophy, but mm. it was almost like the philosophy of business. How do you see things from multiple perspectives? And that stuff really, really fascinated me. And when I when I was in it, I found that um, it was like coming home. What a great know. place to yeah. be! Yeah. What it a was great wonderful. Place yeah, to be. The sacrifices that you've had to make on your journey. Well. I've sacrificed my common sense on many occasions. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's and, not. And I don't know if it's my own sacrifices. It's mm. it's sacrificing other people. You know, what have I done with family? You know, and do I spend enough time with friends and kids? And and how much am I driven by my own neuroses? And pathologies are forcing to achieve. Because that's the other thing that that's I think. That's so true. Yeah? I, th I think it is true of a lot of people. It's true of me. Yeah, mm. well, and I think it's, uh, um, you know. I've been sure, wanting to speak so, to you, you know, about that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, it's almost I'm like listening. being neurotically obsessed to be successful. Know, you know, why do I, we do this? Mm. It's not oh necessary. Because the other thing, you can't be creative really when you're kind of being pathologically or neurotic. You've actually got to chill and let your thinking Relax. broaden. Relax. Yeah, because uh, then your mind patterns in different ways. A friend of mine once, said, uh, once mm. was given advice and uh, the advice was, you're too busy because mm. he, wanted, he wanted to be rich. This was the, mm. this thing. Mm. And he said, uh, the person that was speaking to him said, you're too busy to be rich. You're mm. never going to be rich if you're so busy because you, you're, just, you're too focused. You're, you're too pathological. You're too there. That's right. Um, and yeah, so I like this idea of just letting, it, letting your hair down a little bit. You, you, there's a wonderful story about these mm. two footballers who, who hated each other. 
and they were brought in at massive expense into the same team. And there's a shot of the ball looping into the penalty area, and these two guys running towards it, and wham, they hit each other oh, just yeah. before the ball goes, and the ball trickles over the touchline. And then you compare that with uh, Dwight York, and who did he play with? I can't remember. Uh, Andy Cole. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. They had an incredible was, partnership with Manu, Black, which is a great... United, Blackburn, anyway, yes, yeah. Manu, please, yeah, yeah. greatest football <laughs> team ever. Oh, no, okay, we're going to have to end this conversation. Please now. stop <laughs> this <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, they had this – because their peripheral vision wasn't closed by this competitiveness, they were, had this sort of state of flow where they were mm. able to sense where each other were. And, and, mm. and literally, physically, their peripheral vision broadens. And so mm. they were able to see and, and do this incredible partnership, unselfish partnership, where they mm. succeeded together. Mm. And that's what always fascinated me. So I got attracted by the world of innovation, creativity, and that sort of thinking. How can we create this flow experiences, organizations where – a lot of you is welcome. I mean, how much of you is welcome at work? Mm. How much of you is welcome at work? That's a very tough question to answer. It's a tough question to try and consume even. Um, let's move on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's fascinating but it is, because it's, if, you, if you want people to be creative, you can't be dogmatic and autocratic. I mean, people need stress and tension and they, they do need parameters mm. and testing and provocation. Mm. But you can't be kind of you can't suppress people because if people are going to be creative it's it's a voluntary act it's going to come out of them in this sort of way this flow way a very natural way yeah I think. and therefore their emotions must be at work mm. therefore you have to manage emotions and you have to be emotional or, or be capable of being aware and integrating emotions in who you are if you're going to manage creativity you mm. have to let people be more of themselves at work well, well here that leads us straight uh, into are a, you a nice an author question. Have you written your own books? No, I mean, I write a bit, but uh, I haven't written a book yet. It always seems to be too darn busy, really. What is uh, yeah. two books that you think every entrepreneur should read? Every entrepreneur. Well, Steve Jobs, it was the um, autobiography of the Yogi. That was the one that he talked about. I'm, I'm struggling through that one at the moment. I'm mm. a bit intense. You know, I think some of the Beano comics are great. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, yeah. no, but I was I was influenced by... A lot of books. It's really hard to to find. I mean, I'm reading now the Execution book by Ram Charam and Larry Bossidy, which is an old book, but it's good about execution. Mm. On the other hand, I think some of the great novels are fantastic because they tell stories and narratives, mm. Mm. and we live life in narrative. And I think if you try and live by a plan, you miss the whole point. You've got to have this sense of what's my narrative and other the people's journey, narratives. The journey, great, great. Mm. Yeah. Oh, very nice. And there's a great book called Time to Think by Nancy Klein, which is we use a lot. It's about how you listen consciously and help other people think by the quality of your listening without interruption, just by the quality of your attention, let people talk and their minds wander off and, and solve their own problems. And you can do that, the gifted. You can do it just by listening in, in a really surrendering and, and supportive way. Uh, the, uh, that, the, the contrast between the ego um, of, and I say it with respect, the, the MBA and this mm. idea of listening very I don't carefully. I don't know I'm an MBA. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's a very interesting, it's called attention right mm. there. Uh, I think this is a fascinating conversation, but again, we've run out of time. The, the, Dean John Foster. Things, okay. things move fast here in the future CEOs uh, or, mm. and Cliff Central Studios. Um, we're going to have to have you back. Are you, are you willing be. to come back? Of course, I'd love to. It's, I'd love to chat to you two guys, actually. Yeah. Oh, no, well, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, maybe one last question mm. before we part company. Mm. We ask this to a lot of individuals, a lot of executives, a lot of CEOs. It's if you were to go back in time mm. and speak to the future CEO you, the, the young 20-year-old ambitious uh, future CEO you, what would you say to you? Love even more. Mm. Yeah, just, 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 just really don't, don't – um, just, just do more of the stuff you were stigmatizing yourself and think you oughtn't to. Give yourself permission a little bit more to be wacky, eccentric, to go there. It's not actually at all wacky. Mm. It's that stuff that's educated out of us. We're so mm. driven. Let yourself find the – explore the extremes of your character and your consciousness. Go there. Mm. Do it because you know what? It really pays off. Business is about consciousness at the end of the day. And it's about value and exchange. You've got to understand what other people value, how to provide value. It's not about you need an ego, but you have to always master it. And there's a wonderful quote, final quote is, mm. why you, you know, I'm trying to be humble. You know, somebody, somebody says to a person, why are you trying to be so humble? You're not great enough to be humble. Mm. Just, just talk out, you know. Yeah. Just be yourself, and mm. I think that's Very it. Nice. We're not. A lot of us aren't great enough to be humble, so don't be arrogant. But just 
go there. So even push yourself further. Mm. Libby, a final thoughts? You're making me think in dimensions in this 25 minutes that I haven't thought before. So for me, that's a great impact and high touch. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you.